Copyright Stanford University. All rights reserved. It's not just an epiphenomenon that people are, appear to be gaining weight and gaining other metabolic syndrome factors in association with AFib. You can clearly intervene on that. Just there is a very important point. We used to be taught that AF begets AF, that once you start on the slippery slope, the disease process is inexorable. We already can see from this and other studies in our own patients that does not need to be the case. So, what are some mechanistic therapies that we can apply in AF and where have they failed and how can we improve them? In the left inset, you have the inside of a saline-filled porcine heart in AFib. And what you can see, sorry about the lighting, but you can see that the atrial structure is trabeculated and irregular, and of course it's beating very quickly. The net corollary is that without anticoagulation, you can develop clots in the atrium shown here, which obviously can give this, be the substrate for systemic thromboembolism and stroke, which is arguably the biggest problem with atrial fibrillation, but not the only. So, how can we prevent this? The standard therapy is anticoagulation, which I won't dwell on today. We've had many talks, including by uh, Bernard Gersh recently at the end of last year on that topic. Antirhythmic drugs are one way that we've used for about 30 years to try and suppress AF as a disease entity. And here's quite a good study called the Safety Trial that was published in 2005 that looked at two antirhythmic drugs and showed that amiodarone was a fairly good drug We've probably, those of you who are clinical in the audience would have heard of that, but even amiodarone only has a 60 to 70% success rate, um, and the other drugs we commonly use are less effective. So right there we have a problem with treating this disease by medications alone. And for this and other reasons, we've moved on to ablation. Now ablation holds the promise of eliminating the disease-forming entity or mechanism in the heart. For some rhythms, ablation is truly curative. In fact, the field of electrophysiology grew up on this sort of diet. This is what I was fed at med school and through fellowship, where we had diseases such as Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. You've probably heard of it. There's an accessory pathway that's present from, from birth. Most of the atrioventricular musculature regresses by the 26th week in some pa of, of, um, uh, in utero, but in some patients and in some individuals it remains and can be the substrate for a short circuit, even though it first becomes manifest at 30 or 50 or 60. We don't know why. However, when you identify that, you can cure people truly with a very high success rate. The Kaplan-Meier curve shows in the top bar the results from ablation, and in the bottom bar, arrhythmia recurrence. If you don't ablate somebody, and this is one study I picked up from Peponi and Al, there are many others that show the same thing. This was a condition, ladies and gentlemen, which until the 60s was sometimes fatal. Patients would have sudden death in the presence of known Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, people would have repeated hospitalizations, and there were a series of adverse events. And yet, by understanding the mechanism, which took a series of detailed surgical mapping studies, which in their day were revolutionary, we took a condition that was sometimes fatal and often problematic, and took it to a one-hour procedure with a 98% success rate. Can we have used that as our paradigm for ablation. Does that hold for AF? I'm sad to report that in the current day, it doesn't. And that's why we're having this talk today and why you're having lunch. So atrial fibrillation ablation results. This is a meta-analysis published uh, two years ago in a Journal of the American Heart Association looking at the success rates of a single procedure. There is no question that AF ablation is more successful than drug therapy in patients with AFib. But unfortunately, the overall success rates are a little less than we would ideally like, somewhere in the 50 to 70% range. That's not bad, but the question is, how can we make that better? And that's been the focus of Dr. Wong, myself, uh, Dr. Tarekia, the others in the Cardiac Arrhythmia Center here at Stanford. And really, it comes down to understanding what these mechanisms are and how can we design tools at the interface of bioengineering to better detect them. I'm going to do this pretty briefly. But here you've got an ECG showing sinus rhythm. There's a trigger, and the rest of the ECG is an AFib. Okay, so this is not a surprise. 
The standard approach to ablation has been to identify trigger beads, which were, diag which were detected from um, a paper in 1998 by Michel Hassiger in France to be near or around the pulmonary veins. So we tend to perform our procedures largely in those areas. The problem is that triggers can also rely, ar arise in other parts of the heart. And one thing we've never focused on for a variety of reasons is what is sustaining AFib after the triggers occur? So we can eliminate a trigger, but what if another trigger comes up? In the presence of the substrate that keeps AFib going, how do we eliminate AFib after that time? So that comes us down to the standard dichotomy for which we develop solutions. And that is, what actually is AFib? Is it, and what is ventricular fibrillation by the same token? Is it a series of meandering disordered wavelets, which you can see here in the top right, top left, sorry, which are extinguishing, bifurcating, colliding. Uh, wavelets basically hit a boundary, extinguish, and so the rate of regeneration has to be at or greater than that rate. Or are they a more localized focal source? This mechanism has been uh, first postulated about 50 years ago by Gordon Moe, 1964. And this explains disorganization. But if you look at the success rates of ablation I just showed you, there are many centers in the country and in the world who do a substantial amount of ablation and still somehow don't manage to eliminate AFib in their patients. It's unclear why. The opposing hypothesis is that this very complex dynamical system is actually driven by some localized dynamical sources which interplay in a nonlinear fashion which may occasionally appear and disappear, and which together produce this disorganized rhythm. There are actually several important corollaries. If that is true, that instead of doing a substantial ablation that we'll see later has potential risks and limited success, would it be possible eventually to, walk to work towards a strategy where you can locally treat atrial fibrillation and maybe even ventricular? Now, these localized sources were shown to exist in animal models since about 1992 by pioneering work by um, Jose Halife and Davidenko, Nature 1992. And they've been shown in many models. But until recently, they were never demonstrated in humans. So I'm going to show you a case. I'm going to jump forwards. This is the sort of jumping forward to what we have developed as a bioengineering solution. Here you have AFib in a patient. This patient had had AFib for many years intermittently. This patient presented to our laboratory to be tested using a system that we had developed under IOB approval. This map shows the equivalent, as, Dr. as Joe said, of an optical map. It's actually not an optical map. It's a computationally derived optical map, if you will, of activation in AFib in the right atrium and left. The right atrium is very disorganized with activation times being red, blue, yellow, and all colors in between interspersed in the right. But in the left, you can see what seems to be an organized source. I'm going to show you that this here is actually the, the first rotor that was described in human atria. And we are, I'm going to show you in a second how we actually ablated at this area with an ablation catheter that we apply in the clinical lab and, how, and the effect of that ablation. So here's this rotor in the low left atrium. Ablation is being performed. Rotation is ongoing. Rotation just stopped. AF is ebbing away. AF stopped. And sinus rhythm resumed from the high right atrium. So I'll just let that play again. This does not happen in every case. But we've seen this in many cases after we developed this system. What we see here is a very disorganized set of activations in a dynamical system driven by, in this experiment, which turned out to be a clinical case, by localized intervention at a localized source. So based on this, I'll just say that um, we've done a series of clinical studies that I'll describe uh, with the methodology in, in about 30 seconds. But essentially, we call this procedure focal impulse and rotor modulation. And when you add this to standard ablation procedures, which I showed you before, have about a 50 to 60% success rate, the success rate goes up, both in studies performed by ourselves that were published over the last few years, and in a series of studies performed by independent 
outside centers that were published at the end of last, year's, last year in patients that were fairly challenging AF patients. So now, how can, I, how can we get from the concept that AF is random disorganization or high order determinism to the fact that, in fact, you can identify it as a localized set of dynamical constraints around one, two, or three sources. So we're going to talk about the fact that complex rhythms are more than an extension of, of simple ones. So this uh, reminds me of this quote. My dad was a big US historian, Dewey defeats Truman, or complex arrhythmias are not necessarily random multi-wavelets. So what is a simple rhythm? How do we identify it? And why does a complex rhythm differ? This is a very simple rhythm where we basically show the right atrium here. And you can see that there's activation, which is spreading. And we can see electrograms. If you were to put a catheter in this portion of the heart, you'd see this tracing. If you put a catheter in this portion of the heart, you see this tracing. In this portion of the heart, you see this tracing. And so you can see a nice linear sequence as you march around the structure, which is a tricuspid annulus. And so you can see that the beats are the same here, the same here, the same here. And this was our basis for understanding arrhythmias. You put a catheter in some area, and then again and again, you can trace the circuit. This is another way of depicting it. And you can see that in this case, the circuit is consistent. This is a, a tool that we commonly use these days to visualize. It doesn't provide any insight into mechanism. It just visualizes what we were doing ourselves for the past 30 years. Now, here's the problem with atrial fibrillation. So I'm going to call on one of the fellows in the audience, Dr. Kaiser, to try and interpret that electrical tracing. And it's a rhetorical question. Because it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to visually piece together vectorial flows or vectorial propagation in a series of atrial fibrillation electrograms. You can pick any sites you want, but it's really difficult to know whether this <coughs> sequence, which I've just drawn stylistically, which goes from here to there and down to there, rep which might represent this pass, how that differs to the next 200 milliseconds in time or the next 200 milliseconds in time, there's clearly something we're missing when it comes to atrial fibrillation. Because this is an inconsistent circuit, it's very difficult to map with a probe that you move around, because by definition, it's temporally unstable. The first insights into what atrial fibrillation was, apart from really in uh, uh, computer models, came from optical imaging. I'm sure this audience is very familiar with optical mapping. This is uh, from the work of uh, Pepe Halife, I'm now in Michigan, and I'll play that again. And the notion here is that you can get a very broad spatial view of excitable tissue by staining with a dye which fluoresces at a certain wavelength when tissue is electrically activated. Here you can see regions of disorganization. You can all see, also see areas of rotors. Almost every optical mapping study that's been performed of AFib has shown rotors or localized sources in atrial fibrillation. That's in a variety of animal models, guinea pig, dog and, and down and up and everything in between. Interestingly, almost all the studies that have not used optical mapping have not seen rotors. Now, optical mapping would be very effective to treat our patients. But the problem is optical dyes are toxic, not clinically available for that and other reasons. You'd have to be able to image through the blood pool, which absorbs across a broad wavelength of light from about 520 up way into the near infrared. And you'd have to account for motion artifacts. So how do we do this? So what we decided to do, and this is work going back really about 15 years, was to try and perform some form of transformation between the signals we see in the heart, which are fiendishly complicated. And this sort of activation pattern, the analogy would be you've got raindrops, but you can work, you could potentially identify where the sources were in that dynamical system, if you knew certain basic properties, such as the conduction velocity or propagation of, of speed of a circular wave across that pond of water, how it varied with the depths of water, how it varied with the speed at which an obstacle fell into it, and so on. And similarly, if you had some local, this is the massive tourbillon in the south of France, how you could identify when wavelets actually disorganized or remain coherent using the same tissue properties. And so we went about over the past decade and a bit understanding this. 
Electrophysiology 101, and I'm almost wrapping up here. I, won't, I don't want to bore you with this, but there are certain critical features you have to have for the heart tissue to activate and recover. It's called the basis for reentrant activation. And you can see here three beats in the bottom left and four beats in the top right. So in beat one, these uh, cells have uh, this recovers longer than uh, this recovery time is longer than this. So the first beat activates in both regions. The second beat, which is the second yellow bar, activates in both regions. The same with the third. The fourth beat is early. Because the recovery time is longer here, it blocks. Because the recovery time is shorter on this cycle, it conducts. And this allows you to create a circuit. And this is the basis for, we think, not just Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, but atrial fibrillation and even life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. In the human heart, there had not been a lot of work of identifying what these properties were, the conduction velocity and the refractoriness. And so we set about doing studies to look at that over the past several years in human left and right atria. So the results of the mapping are as follows. This is a standard approach to mapping atrial fibrillation. You have a surgical plaque, and you can see here a very disorganized activation spread. If you look at this, you'd be hard pushed to say that there's any order to it. One criticism that's been made is these are very small plaques. That's true. So we can double the size. This is to scale. You can double the size of that and look in the left atrium as well. And it doesn't really take you very far. So it's easy to say there's no localized source. Recent studies have actually looked at in, the, in the surgical lab in Australia, recently published looking at plaques of this size. It's hard to get a complete view of the human heart under any conditions, particularly in the OR. But if you were to do broad mapping in the electrophysiolo electrophysiology laboratory, using techniques that were available to us to map signals broadly and to computationally reconstruct optical maps, then you could see that in this one case where I just showed you it's very difficult to see localized sources, just outside where those standard plaques were mapped, there is indeed a localized source. And this is the one I showed you earlier, where we demonstrated that by ablating in that center, we actually shut the atrial fibrillation down. So in this way, um, this approach has actually caused a lot of momentum. Uh, Pre-2011, there were no studies in the world showing that there were these rotational sources in human atrial fibrillation. Uh, after our work and, uh, was presented and others have also verified it, there are now many groups around the world who are showing that these sources exist, that they may be important in driving the dynamical complexity, that they can be targets for therapy, and that opens up a lot of mechanistic studies into why those areas actually exist in different patients. Are they related to SCAR? Are they, and I'll talk about this briefly at the end. So this has been a multi-disciplinary uh, effort. These are the members of the extended team here at Stanford. We've got the electrophysiology team. Um, Dr. Tureke bridges both teams. We have uh, Ken Mahaffey helping with the clinical trials aspect. Uh, and this also has led to a lot of mentorship with many of our fellows uh, in the um, Cardiac Arrhythmia Center being funded to this year, as well as technology transfers, as Joe Wu mentioned earlier. I'll just say that we've extended this paradigm into broader areas, in particular the results, which I think are very exciting, a little scary, of ablating localized sources for life-threatening ventricular fibrillation. This is a report that's um, in review hope, uh, and should be published soon. This is a gentleman who was 72 with quite bad heart disease, previous bypass surgery, ejection fraction of 21%, bad heart failure, previous biventricular pacing, and a lot of ICD shocks for VF in four months before he got to us. And this is an example of a shock that was clearly very rapid rhythm. Um, we took this patient to the laboratory, and we induced ventricular fibrillation, mapped it for 10 seconds, and then cardioverted the patient. In the at 10 seconds, we had information to identify localized rotational sources, which we ablated. This gives you a sense for the EPs and the audience of where they were. They were near border zone of scar. And after the ablation, we were no longer able to induce VF. In one year and two months since the procedure, the patient has had no ICD therapies at all on no drugs. So these are small numbers of patients, um, but still they open a very interesting horizon into the whole field of sudden death, the interface with structural disease and arrhythmias. On that topic, my penultimate slide, is what anchors AFROSES, and I think this is a very important area.
Uh, there have been studies showing that some of the rotor areas could be localized regions of, low, of scar. For the images in the audience, uh, we're working very closely with Dr. Yang and trying to identify tissue characterization in the atrium and the ventricle, which has recently had a lot of attention as a potential arrhythmic substrate that could anchor localized sources or potentially be the substrate for multiple break, for wave break that can cause disorganized activation. Um, on a more basic level, there's some data, and this is from, an opt, uh, from a, a modeling study we published last year, that fiber anisotropy could be important in driving cardiac fibrillation in patients. And as a little bit of a tease, there are, uh, one of the strongest genetic signals in inherited atrial fibrillation is uh, the 4P25 SNP that is close to the coding region of PITX2C. PITX2C has been shown to be expressed uh, preferentially in the left atrium in some patients with AFib, such as this study, and in other groups has been shown to be related to chirality of fiber formation in left versus right atrium, which yields the very interesting hypothesis speculation that some aspects of atrial fibrillation gen uh, generation could actually be inherited in terms of fiber architecture. With that, I'll just leave with my last slide. And I said that it's important to improve AF fibrillation. Um, and one of the reasons is that what we do currently can be lengthy and complex. And there is a known complication rate from AF fibrillation in the current time. One of the focuses of Dr. Wong, the biodesign program, and the Arrhythmia Center in general is to try and improve the whole um, clinical profile of the procedures that we perform mechanistically through to clinical outcome. You can see these, ablate, these uh, complication rates. If you had to choose, ladies and gentlemen, between a more localized set of ablations, such as those done here, and a more general set of ablation, which is actually a very commonly performed procedure, uh, I would ask you, ladies and gentlemen, which of these procedures would you choose for your mother, and which of these would you choose for your mother-in-law? <laughs> Um, and I'll just stop with saying that the bioengineering for complex arrhythmias, we believe this is one of the final frontiers in the field of understanding the interface between structural disease and arrhythmias. Um, and I'll move on to say that atrial fibrillation is an area in which we've had a lot of basic data that's now been demonstrated uh, in other centers. And Dr. Wong will lead on to see how the biodesign program is extending this into ventricular arrhythmias. Thank you very much. Terrific. Uh, great. Uh, before I uh, take my uh, few minutes uh, to talk, um, uh, I don't think um, I can uh, praise uh, Sanjeev enough in terms of what he's accomplished. So uh, rarely in any institution throughout the world do we have the opportunity to have someone who's made such a singular impact on a field. And it's in terms of the, in fact, this will be my kind of thesis and my uh, slide presentation really in terms of being able to bring to bear, uh, in his case, computational biology to really a very human problem. And so very, very few institutions have that you know, ability, and, and we really have that uh, uh, here with his uh, contribution. Great. Can I go ahead? Okay, if you can choose which one you need. Yep. And I will shift this to the level there. Terrific. I was going to say, uh, Okay, great. Uh, so I entitled this uh, Creating uh, Arrhythmia Therapy for the Future. And so really it's designed upon the thesis uh, that really we need to bring a, together a community. Uh, and that community really is here to really, we ask the question, why innovate? So uh, we're all here in this room because we believe cardiovascular diseases uh, play an important uh, part of morbidity, mortality throughout the world. And so there are a number of disorders uh, which we'll, we'll be, uh, we all want to tackle. So this is a picture, believe, bless you, uh, of kind of this uh, space at Stanford. So you see humanities and sciences, engineering, medicine, uh, that happens to be the Clark Center, but really it's more uh, figurative that I'm trying to get at, that there's a place in which we all come together in our minds that are truly collaborative. And that's really the thesis of this, that we're going to need to bear to solve these problems together, really be, will be uh, together that we can bring all these fields together. 
And so our field actually touches upon, uh, as Dr. Narayan has mentioned, atrial fibrillation, sudden cardiac death. We touch upon heart failure as well. But I, I'll argue that really what we need to do is uh, really recruit a new generation of collaborators. That is, create a new generation of interdisciplinary work uh, in which we can solve problems. And that's really important because scientists throughout the world have many problems to solve. And so our job, particularly at a place like Stanford, is to create this kind of community where people who otherwise may not talk to each other or even know we exist uh, become aware of these important problems, in, in particular cardiovascular disease. And I really argue that is really where we are as a field uh, and in terms of the, the history of the world. So, uh, the disciplines you see here, these are examples at Stanford of, of the potential of collaboration and really solving many of these difficult problems, ones that Dr. Narayan has already shown that are potentially quite solvable when we bring together uh, truly different disciplines uh, overall. And so in my talk, I'll, I'll give you examples of uh, really just as, as a, an example of things that we can do to bring people together who otherwise may not uh, be uh, brought together to solve some of these problems. And so it starts in terms of looking at these needs, and some, some of these needs uh, really are very fundamental. So they may be understanding the mechanism and etiologies of disease, improving simply the diagnosis of the condition. And there are a variety of very important areas of defining risk. Uh, so that may be true for patients with uh, rhythms like atrial fibrillation, other conditions, and certainly people who are at risk of sudden cardiac death. So these are very important needs in our area. Uh, identifying areas that we should treat, and Dr. Narayan's work has been pioneering in that, in terms of saying, well, this is an area, this relates to the mechanism of the disorder, and so that we can have new insights and new ways of treating these conditions. These relate to the process, disease process itself. So we know that there are important predictors, uh, presumed factors in the etiology, and they range from uh, what we call aging uh, to that of uh, systemic diseases and disorders such as hypertension, metabolic syndrome, other uh, systemic uh, conditions as well. And we believe they're mediated by a whole range of different cascades of processes, including uh, circulating factors, uh, elevation of pressures within the heart, et cetera, and resulting in very important both ultrastructural changes, that is, in the area of fibrosis, connection expression, and then fundamentally in our situation, uh, that of functional changes that occur. And I'll, I'll try to argue in all of cardiovascular disease, uh, there are very few areas that bring so many different challenges and fields uh, in, 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 as that of electrophysiology. In many ways, we're very similar to the field of neuroscience, where one has to bring in many different disciplines to try to approach these kinds of problems. And so you've heard Dr. Narayan talk about this very important, uh, really, dis discovery of that of these uh, rotors uh, that we have. And, and certainly what I'm trying to argue is our next phase of discovery is really trying to link that to some of these ultra-structural and functional uh, properties that need to be further characterized and developing the tools together that we can do that. And so these are, these are some of the different areas that we'll touch upon better imaging, different computational solutions that we'll need to be able to understand what the ultra-structural um, changes and functional changes relate to this mechanism. So Dr. Ryan mentioned the need to image better. And so this is some of the work that's been done in Utah that uh, Dr. Yang is helping us uh, uh, do here and, and, and pioneer the next stage in this. And there are other goals that are really looking at comparison to histology uh, and that of in vivo microscopy. Those are areas that we really need to apply to really fur uh, further our understanding of how the structure and function uh, are intertwined. This is some work that was done, um, uh, reported recently, in using uh, various forms of imaging. This is a, a form of uh, NADH fluorescence it's, that people are trying to use to uh, in vivo uh, examine tissue properties. And so we need to bring to bear these kinds of resources in terms of imaging. So we asked this question, really, how can we do better in terms of looking at these different uh, changes? How can we look at these functional characteristics and link them to the mechanisms that we can identify? 
And so these are some of the, uh, I think the next steps uh, for the field are to link uh, these uh, different observations uh, computationally to that of fibrosis and really be able to predict uh, predictive models of where in fact these rotors and these functional um, uh, mechanisms uh, will exist. Okay, so how does that take us from one paradigm to the other? And Dr. Narines mentioned this. Do you take a, a blast the entire heart, the entire atrium, uh, very much a surgical paradigm? That is, if the surgeon has one shot. Surgeon does not want to come back, so you need to really have a very uh, uh, broad-based solution. Uh, do we need to have, do we have instead a contemporary treatment? That is, we're looking at what it is now, but how do, the, how do we look at those two together? What's the future of evolution? Since we're looking at a certain snapshot in time of natural history, what is that natural history going to be in terms of structure and function? Those are the things that we need to answer the question of to have the, the proper solutions. Okay, uh, so I'll go on. So that is the question of the natural history that I talk about. And so do we have, for example, a lesion set that's going to work and deal with these for the future? Or, or what we do in a contemporaneous uh, treatment set, is that going to be adequate? So we'll, we'll talk more about this. So one of the evolutions that um, uh, was alluded to is that of extended or very extensive surgery. That is the maze surgery, which is an open heart surgery to very specific improved lesion sets that are much more targeted. One approach that has been, uh, that I'll mention briefly is this combination of creating uh, different, but in hopefully better uh, lesion sets. And by that I mean more lasting, long lasting uh, lesions that we can create. So many of the limitations we have now are limitations in what we call lesion formation. And I'll talk about that. So our strategy, our limitations or our opportunities for success are one that of improving our mapping strategy, identify as Dr. Narayan has done, where we should ablate, but we need to ablate actually more efficiently and effectively, creating the least amount of damage and the most efficiency. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these determinants. Some of them is to be able to work within the heart. We try to, for minimally invasive purposes, we're outside the body. Most of our tools are about a meter away from the heart itself. So how do you get precise control down to the millimeter range when you're a meter away? Is that possible? How can we create the ultimate in terms of control as if your hand was in the heart, patient's heart? So we'll talk about this. There are a number of energy sources. Uh, one of my colleagues is doing work um, with a local company using a linear accelerator to deliver energy non-invasive. So uh, truly one of the holy grails of our field. This is one other aspect that we've done uh, some work on is trying to ablate from two sides of the heart, from the endocardial to the epicardial. Uh, perhaps a more invasive approach indeed, but maybe one where we can get better results. Uh, I'll, I think I can show you this nice movie. So one of the holy grails of our field is that of can you have a catheter that can negotiate through all of the complexity of the heart? And this is work in, in Professor Camarillo's laboratory that I hope will come about. Uh, okay. Ah, yes, okay, here it's connecting. So what is the purpose of this and why do I feel so excited about this uh, work? Uh, it almost worked. Allow now. <sighs> Go back. Ah, there it's going, okay, we'll try it. Okay, so what's happening here? So this is not driven by human. This is a computer uh, having the, essentially a robot find its way around obstacles. So this is in many ways, in my view, the holy grail of robotic control. So it's not the physician trying to turn his brain upside down to figure out how we make 90 degree turns right and left, but the computer determining how it can negotiate through a complex environment very safely. And so I think this is some of the most promising work that exists anywhere in the world in terms of robotics. And, and indeed, I think where we need to go. Okay, so this is one other solution that we've been working on for now about a decade with uh, Fritz Prince, the chair of mechanical engineering here. And so what it does is to really try to approach the problem in a different way. So all of our catheters move within space, meaning we're a meter away, we move the catheter in and out, in and out in 3D space. 
But our kind of strategy was if you can create a two-dimensional problem, that might make the, sol the solution much easier. And so the way where you can make it a two-dimensional problem is you can so-called land on the surface of the heart. And then by doing that, you might be able to, in fact, create this moon rover with gripping elements. And we have an ongoing project uh, in this regard uh, currently, uh, trying to develop new mechanisms to be able to accomplish that. Uh, so more to come on that area. Guidance using imaging is really important, and some of our uh, radiology colleagues are uh, very important, uh, have been very involved with us in terms of this. So one of the, the limitations in terms of our lesion formation is we really can't see them. It seems extraordinary that that's true, but we cannot see our own, the lesions we make. So some of our recent work has been trying to look at that. You can see that, in fact, you can see some of the lesions grossly, and this is through a, um, a video camera system uh, that we did some work with. Uh, this is uh, the result of an in vivo experiment where you can see this is from a video camera. This is a uh, histological or a, a gross specimen. So it's possible you're using certain tools to be able to see better where you are. But the visual, the ability of the eye to see these differences is still pretty limited. So we actually, uh, a couple years ago, um, uh, one of the pioneers in vision here at Stanford is in the Department of Psychology, Brian Wendell. And in addition to his understanding of kind of what happens in the brain in terms of vision, he's developed some very, uh, uh, really clever digital imaging processing techniques. And so we've had a project, uh, again, for about a, a year or two, uh, looking at what's called multispectral imaging analysis to try to optimize the ability to detect very small changes in the uh, properties of the tissue when uh, there might be different kinds of tissue as well as uh, the results of ablation. And that's some of the work we presented here. So there are obviously another, a, a number of other future approaches that is in gene therapy, understanding the pathways that lead to some of these ionic channels. Those are some of the big areas. There's new uh, opportunities in using low energy defibrillation, other ways of converting these kind of serious arrhythmias. Uh, optogenetics is one area, obviously, at Stanford that's been pioneered. This is a work of one of my colleagues uh, did a, a, a several years ago, uh, demonstrating um, uh, in, in, vi in vitro uh, that you can, in fact, use optogenetics, and many of the people uh, here have uh, gone on to pioneer that work as well. Uh, next, I'd like to present to you, uh, let's see, I think it's just slow, okay, no, let's see, here we go, uh, this. So this is a work out of Greg Kovacs' lab that Laurent Givon Grandi has done that I think is, uh, again, uh, has the potential of making huge impacts. So I'll play this little movie for you. And you can see that what's happening is stimulations occurring from the left corner. That's very normal in its pattern. Then you'll see this block. So he's created this area, and you'll see that the region inside the block is not changing color. So what he's able to do is to create an electrical mechanism by which he can prevent conduction from occurring. This is the holy grail of electrical control, in, in our opinion. So techniques like this of being able to turn it on off cells and regions of cells um, in, in vivo would be extraordinarily important tools in our ability to map and identify uh, critical structures. So these are just some of the examples. I'll end with an, uh, another collaboration we, we have with Zenon Bao, who's been a pioneer. She was w the f one of the first uh, in the world. She was on a team to develop a flexible uh, electronics, a flexible chip when she was in Bell Labs in Princeton. Um, and then she's currently doing pioneering work using flexible electronics. And we currently have a collaboration which is um, to look at various sens sensory uh, kind of inputs, pulse pressures, and things like that as well. So again, in my summary is that we'll understand the mechanism, and uh, this understanding mechanism will pioneer these future therapies, as well as creating this community of diverse scientists and engineers that will lead to the greatest breakthroughs, in my opinion. This is a program that we're going to have uh, next year. This is uh, 2016, believe it or not. And that will be uh, here uh, in this building uh, right above us. that will highlight uh, uh, some of the world's experts in new arrhythmia technology. So again, I thank you. And I thank you on behalf of Dr. Narayan as well. Thank you. Thank you. So any questions for Paul and Sanjeev? Yes, go ahead.
Uh, Bill. Uh, yeah, how was that region of block um, created? Mm -hmm. You shine light on the cells and... Oh, sorry. So the work, uh, so certainly optogenetics is a very important way. This was done with high-frequency electrical signals. But it was targeted at that area? In this area, there's an applicator that has that shape. So it just, it's shape-dependent, yes. Yes, uh, the question was whether weight loss can help to manage patients with AFib, and there's a lot of programs who are focused on this as a concerted effort, as you say. There are, in fact, some groups outside the United States who won't do an ablation on somebody unless they sign mm -hmm. a contract where they lose X pounds in weight. We haven't gone that far yet. But <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Does the amount of AFib you have in minutes <clears throat> correlate to the risk of stroke? And we used to feel that it did. And in some ways, there's evidence that there is a burden point. Um, some of the studies that have recently been published using implantable devices that have minute resolution suggest that as little as 5.5 minutes a day of AFib may actually increase your risk of atrial fibrillation actuarially on, on in a measurable way. Of course, we're dealing with very low rates up to double a lower rate, but it's still a measurable effect. On the other hand, <clears throat> there is a converse opinion that's growing sentiment that, in fact, you should anticoagulate patients, individuals, not based on how much AFib they have, but based on other risk factors, which probably are the driver of stroke and thromboembolism more than the amount of AF. Um, and I'll talk to, I'll let Paul add to that if you want to. Sure. Um, actually, I just wanted to, before uh, we go too far, I wanted to thank Joe and the Cardiovascular Institute for all of its support. I think the Cardiovascular Institute represents this collaborative environment that, okay. again, this is, this is what makes Stanford special and really, I think, going to really allow all this to happen. So his support's been extraordinary. Great. Any other questions that you have? Yes. Thank you. Um, the question is, is the is, uh, inherited component of atrial fibrillation thought to be through development or environmental? I am not an expert in that area, but what I will say is there are several signals which have emerged. Uh, they relate to a relatively small number of patients, the patients who usually say have low AFib, which means no structural disease, typically no hypertension. Uh, the SNP I mentioned is one of the largest signals. There are several others. Uh, some are in calcium regulatory subunits. Some are, so there are many different signals. Um, none of them, to my knowledge, has been expressed and has shown a very clear functional relationship to the AFib. And so I'm not sure that we have the answer to your question, although I, it's not my field. The other thing is that PITEX2 is in a non-coding region of which the closest coding region is, but it is not clear that that is the effect. But it's a very, very fertile and large area of research. Many groups, including the MGH, Patrick, Eleanor, um, uh, Fiddle, uh, actually Iceland, and some other groups in the world. I do. Uh, I had a question about your rotor. So I understand you're using elegant modeling. You're an active biological. There are some interesting studies from some of our collaborators that have started to um, point to critical production slowing at rate that occurs either because of anisotropy, which was alluded to, and or fibrosis. So people would say, well, we know about fibrosis, but actually it doesn't have to be the levels of fibrosis which are obvious on a macroscopic specimen or potentially that we're going to see together with MRI. And the, the, so yes, I mean, I think those are the two obvious things. There are probably going to be several other things we haven't 
sort of. There are candidates which are grouped just for functional cancer, such as myocardial. Potentially, there's ischemia, which is grouped as both. Uh, but, and partly that could be because of stretch. And so stretch could independently be an anchoring point. And interestingly, if you think of tummy veins and some other areas that we know are important, they are at particular hinge points or regions of extreme curvature in the atrial geometry. <laughs> Actually, yes, you can. Um, can you create rotors by scarring? You can create rotors in, in many different ways. Chemical reaction is the BZ, the uh, Balutzov Zebatina reaction, where just um, in a, a series of chemical reactions which are, non which are inorganic, you can create spiral tips. And so forming a spiral at dynamical activity um, can occur both in many, as many, in many uh, situations in nature, but even in uniform biological preparations such as monolayers of cells. In terms of anchoring them, which is your specific question, um, we, you can do that in uh, atria by adding fibrosis to them. What you tend to do is get the mix a little wrong, unfortunately, and you turn it into a simple rhythm that I started off with, that very simple flutter. And so, frankly, the true cellular level mechanism for anchoring is currently elusive. And this whole field is somewhat controversial, which I hope I sort of conveyed to you, but the actual mechanism of anchoring of these rotors when they are truly stable, I think is going to be a very exciting area because that's where you could truly make uh, um, inroads by prevention. So the question is, can we, do, does MRI have the, the spatial resolution to address these problems? And uh, we are all, you know, we have hope. In terms of scientific optimism, I think we're, we're somewhat skeptical. There is definitely some signal between structural disease and atrium. There's, I don't think there's a lot of doubt in that. To identify the precise mechanistic locus is going to be difficult. And I think we will never by MRI have that level of resolution, but it is possible that certain spatial patterns will be pr predictive and will lead then in future work. I mean, maybe future, through diffusion, tend to MRI or other advances <laughs> in the future. I'd add that also, um, I'm okay, oh, yeah, that um, uh, using uh, catheters that are developed if you're going to be invasive, so a lot of our work is invasive already, that we may be able to have, you know, using uh, so-called in vivo microscopy, there are a lot of tools that may be at our disposal. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank Thanks you. very thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you. Good. Good. Really good. Copyright Stanford University, all rights reserved.